Well, good morning, everyone. It's a real privilege to be with you. Uh, this is my first time at Southeastern, but I've already been made to feel very welcome in wonderful accommodation, and I'm looking forward to staying around here for a while. I'm going to be dashing off a little bit today to do other things, but I will be around some of the rest of the week and hope to get a chance to talk to you. Now, we're looking today and also tomorrow at the subject of moral objections to the Old Testament. And the reason I want to do that is because I think this is a major way that people are um, attacking the Scriptures today. With the Old Testament, I think the objection often in the 19th century was it didn't happen. That seems to be almost presupposed nowadays. Um, and yet, if you try and make a defense about the historicity of the Old Testament, you'll find that you have to go in some quite obscure areas, and most people don't understand ancient history. So you can't actually make a link with people. On the other hand, most people intuitively feel that they are experts on subjects of morality. And so when they read about the Old Testament, they um, say, well, I read things and they don't seem to be very moral. Now, I'm hoping that my presentation is going to be coming up on the screen about now. Is that right? Well, are we okay there? Still working on the subject. It's there. Okay, and if I can have it in front of me, that would even be even better. Great. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, moral objections to the Old Testament. And I want to begin with looking at the idea of trust. Because one of the big things that we have is, of course, a hermeneutic of suspicion that many people are beginning towards the Old Testament with a, a subject where they don't really think that they can trust God. And the sorts of things that you're prepared to do when you trust someone already are very different from someone that you know nothing about. So my wife might ask me to do something without explaining. It might be a bit strange. But because I trust her, I found her trustworthy over the years, I will do that. On the other hand, if I get a random phone call from a stranger, I won't. And so I think that is a key issue. Another issue when we're looking at difficult questions could be the, the, the idea that God is so much greater than we are and we are so much smaller and trying to think of the analogy of a small child and an adult. Now, the small child is a three-year-old and they're playing in the park. They are having a great time and the adult knows that it's good for that child to go to something else, to leave it. They may be uh, needing a meal, they may be going somewhere even better, or it may be simply it's good for them because they need to learn to obey their parents. I mean, they, you know, there are all sorts of uh, reasons that it might be good for them to leave. And so the adult, with their larger view of things, decides it's time to leave. At this point, the child throws a tantrum because the child feels that the adult does not have morally sufficient grounds in order to take them away. Uh, they survey the situation, and really they see no rational reason why they should give up the enjoyment they're currently having for that sort of very abstract, intangible future which uh, the adult is inviting them to participate in. Now, what we can say in that situation is most of the children who are three don't actually doubt the benevolence of the parent at that point. They do protest, but they don't actually doubt the benevolence of the parent at that point. And I think that may be the situation that we can sometimes be in with difficult situations that occur in our lives. We may protest, we may feel great angst about it, but we can have a trust in God that isn't actually shaken by uh, these uh, tough situations. So that may seem a trivial analogy. But what we find is in the Old Testament, one of the main objections we're getting nowadays is the objection to violence in the Old Testament, and we're going to look at that today, and tomorrow we're going to look at this question of slavery. There is, of course, a big secular narrative of religion and violence being associated. We have the European wars of religion, we have the witch hunts, we have what went on in Northern Ireland, and then uh, we have, uh, more strikingly, the uh, attacks of 9-11 and the Madrid bombing, uh, London bombings and so on, where a big narrative has grown up between the association of religion and violence. Now this is a long-standing thing and many secularists will see a whole way in which religion and violence have been associated going back, and Christianity in particular, going back to the Crusades and so on. And by the way, that's why uh, it would be a good idea for many secularists not to allow Christians into political office because, after all, they've got such a history of oppression, uh, actually having them making some of the key decisions isn't going to be good for people's freedom. So that's how it makes sense to many secularists. And we need to be prepared to challenge that, and hopefully this is going to work. Um, we have 
number of uh, so-called new atheists who have been making these attacks, and particularly Richard Dawkins and the late Christopher Hitchens from Britain, uh, who are top left and bottom right. Also Sam Harris, bottom left, and to a lesser extent Daniel Dennett uh, on the top right. Maybe I'm going to just use a signal. Is that better? Okay, here's a quotation from Dawkins. Some of you will know it. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A blood, uh, uh, vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Well, we find out something about Richard Dawkins' library that at least he has a thesaurus in it. Um, <laughs> and we see the sort of approach he's taking. Now, of course, when we come across another culture, and the Old Testament in particular, we find that there are a number of ways in which it doesn't seem to align. We have the natural strangeness of another culture. If you come to my culture, you will find some things strange. I will have to say that when I come to your culture, I find some things strange. I won't say which. That's not really appropriate. Uh, but the point is, we have, when we're dealing with the Bible, not only another culture, but we have another time as well. Often when you've spent time in a culture, the logic of the way that culture does it makes far more sense. Initially, you just think it's bizarre. And when we look at other cultures, we always tend to look at them thinking of our culture as better. When we look at other time periods, we tend to think of our time period as better. And we also find it very hard to question the assumptions of our culture because the assumptions of our culture are actually built into the language that we use. The very words that we use often encode cultural assumptions. So if we can just do that. Okay, fine. So the objection can come, how can God command the destruction of seven nations? What about the poor innocent children? Isn't that genocide? And, I think quite pressingly, if God could tell those people in the Old Testament back then to kill people, why can't he tell you? Isn't that just like the suicide bombers? So um, that, you can see, is quite a forcible objection. We got, does it, is there a little delay on this? Is that the way it works? I don't know. We'll find out. Anyway. So people are making a, an equation between religious terrorism on the one hand and the sort of genocide that you get sometimes, uh, situations like Rwanda, on the other hand. So the Old Testament is associated with two very nasty things. Now, I want to try and give a multifaceted partial reply to this. I don't want to say that I can take away the problem, but the reason uh, an atheist often finds difficulty here, or many other people find a difficulty here, is because there are a number of different points in their thinking that need to be realigned. So here is just one of a number of factors. One of the factors is actually an atheist believes that they're in a different universe from the universe that the Christians believe they're in. So if we take, for instance, the um, figures of Tom and Jerry, one of the things you may notice uh, if you watch Tom and Jerry is that different physical laws apply in their universe. Have you ever observed that? Um, and so what you find is that certain things that might be done by t Tom unto Jerry or by Jerry unto Tom uh, will actually uh, be reversed in quite a short time. The reason many of us who are parents are prepared to let our children watch these, this sort of thing is because we believe that our children have sufficient discernment to be able to know that if they try this on their sibling, the same physical effects won't actually apply. And so we realize that they can make that distinction. Different physical laws apply. Or you could take another story, Disney's version of The Sorcerer's Apprentice. You chop uh, a broom in half and it becomes two. Now one of the reasons we generally hold intuitively, aside from biblical revelation, that stabbing someone is a bad idea is because it's painful for them and it tends to shorten their life. On the other hand, if stabbing someone gave them pleasure and lengthened their life, it might rather change the morality of stabbing someone. So the physical understanding you have of the universe can actually affect things. Now we take another story, which is the story of Genesis 22, when God tells Abraham to offer up his son Isaac. As an atheist reads this, they think, well, the problem with this story is that the only thing that a person has is their life. You take that away, and that's it. And we know from a Christian perspective, that's not the case. So for God to take away Enoch's earthly existence wasn't a bad thing for Enoch. 
We also know that in this context, God has shown himself to be able to do remarkable things. And in the prior revelation given to Abraham already by the time we get to Genesis 22, we find that God has revealed to Abraham that through Isaac in particular, he's going to have future offspring. Now, at this point, Isaac hasn't had any children. And so Abraham has to know that Isaac is going to have some future existence beyond him sacrificing him. And that has to be a future off, um, uh, existence involving having offspring. It's rather striking that he says to the servants at the bottom of the mountain, I and the boy will come back to you. So I don't need to read on to, to um, Hebrews and cheat and find the end of the story to find out that Abraham knew that God was able to raise him from the dead. I mean, I, I, can, I can get to where Hebrews got just on the basis of the Old Testament. In other words, in a miraculous universe uh, where such things can happen, there may be certain things which, within an atheist universe, can't really work. Of course we can do the usual judo move with an atheist of saying, well, you know, where do you get your morality from? And you know about that uh, reply, so I won't even bother using it. Now, what we can say is that that's just one factor, but the really big factor with any of these things is going to be the question of God's trustworthiness. And so that's what we need to look at. Now, I, um, my view on how we should um, know what's right and wrong is what might be called divine command theory. Many of you have done courses on this. That is, what God commands you is right and, uh, and so on. That's actually what makes right and wrong, God's command. Now, there is an objection that goes to that, which is said, well, isn't, doesn't that mean God can essentially call wrong right and right wrong? Actually, he can't. Because there's an infinite number of things that God can't do. That is, God is almighty, and that means he, is, he has the power to affect everything consistent with his character. That's what it means for him to be almighty, but that does not mean that he can make a God bigger than himself, or two gods bigger than himself, or three or four. That's how I get to inf infinity quite quickly, just keep on counting up. He can't make himself not exist for five seconds, and he can't lie, specifically said in the Bible, he can't lie. God can't just uh, make wrong right. On the other hand, we do understand that in general life, there are things that you can do when you have authorization. I was in an airport recently with a disabled relative, and I was allowed into a bit of the airport that I'm not normally allowed into because I was with them, because I was with an authorized person. In other words, I could do something that would have been morally wrong for me to do if I'd not been with an authorized person. We know the situation in a company where someone does not have the authority to sign a check unless they're told by someone else. Suddenly, that signing of a check changes from being an immoral action to being a moral action, depending on whether they're giving due authority. So in the particular situation of taking someone's life, there is one person who is able to authorize the taking of life, and that is the author of all life. That doesn't mean God can tell you to do absolutely anything. God cannot tell you to worship Satan, because that is inconsistent with his character. But that does not mean that God can't tell you to do something that would have been immoral if he had not told you to do. Now, again, that can still sound quite risky. Many people don't want to make this defense because it sounds like you're opening a really wide goal, soccer goal in this case, in order for uh, the atheist to be able to uh, score a goal into. I don't know how that would work. Uh, maybe hockey. You've got hockey, I mean, ice hockey and so on. Um, so that, that sounds, sounds too risky to open that. But what I want to do is then qualify it with God's character because the more you find out about God's character, the more you realize this is not a big risk. So what we've got to do is think about God's character, someone who reveals himself as merciful, and how the Old Testament actually reveals his merciful action. So he's got a proven character and humans can trust him. So let's have a look at that. When new atheists attack the Old Testament, typically they, uh, they have two attacks that they launch at the same time, and I think this is jolly undecent. The point is this, <clears throat> that they attack the Old Testament in two ways. One is to say it didn't happen, and the other is to say it's unfair. Now, I'd want to respond by saying, if we're looking at the morality of a narrative, whether or not it happened is strictly irrelevant. I can have a view of the morality of the narrative of Harry Potter without believing in its historicity. I can simply look at it as a story. I can look at the morality of the Odyssey without uh, believing it to be historical. I simply look at it as a story. 
if I'm going to look at the morality of the narrative of the Old Testament, I shouldn't be attacking a version of it that I've watered down by saying, well, some of the big historical claims didn't really happen. I need to treat the narrative with integrity. And that means when we look at it, we look at it as a whole. So here we have a, um, Dawkins speaking about um, how he sees the, the narrative of the Old Testament in Joshua. The Bible story of Joshua's destruction of Jericho and the invasion of the Promised Land in general is morally indistinguishable from Hitler's invasion of Poland or Saddam Hussein's massacres of the uh, Kurds and the Marsh Arabs. Or again, we see when Dawkins looks at this story, he sees a story in which God doesn't actually speak to people because he doesn't believe in that. No miracles are performed. There's no massive exodus. And then characters are judged as if God hadn't actually told them to do something. In other words, he sort of uh, waters down the historicity of the narrative and then he attacks the remaining narrative. Now, I'd want to say that if we're going to judge the morality of a narrative, I need to treat the narrative with utter integrity um, with all of its... Um, um, aspects. So when I take the narrative of the Old Testament, I begin at the beginning of the story. The beginning of the Old Testament has God making all life, God likes life, God does not uh, have violence there in the beginning, and clearly that's the pattern he sets up. Now Dawkins might object, but I don't believe in God. But my uh, response would be, but God is the biggest narrative character in the Old Testament. So even if you're, if you're an atheist, you still need to judge the, na the, the morality of the story treating God as a real character in the story. So I can't judge the morality of Odysseus in the Odyssey factoring out Athene because I don't believe Athene, Athene exists. That's simply taking part of the narrative. I've got to treat Odysseus and his interactions with Athene as real when I'm looking at the morality of the narrative. Now, in this narrative, God is real and God gave everyone life. And then you look on to the end of the narrative uh, in terms of chronology, and there at the end of uh, the narrative, we can see an ideal where the wolf uh, dwells with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and so on. In other words, the bookends of the narrative seem to give you God's pattern and his ideal. We then look at the narrative, and we find that in the narrative, strictly, when we're reading the story and not judging its historicity, we're simply just reading it with integrity, we, we see that the Canaanites are judged for their wickedness, not for their race, one evidence of that is the fact that Rahab, who is a Canaanite, is able to switch sides. In fact, she says that she's heard so much of what God has done, and she all, and all the people have heard so much of what God's done, and she's decided to change sides. Implying, by the way, that because she has heard what God has done, and she's decided to change sides, that the others who had heard what God has done could also have decided to change sides, and they didn't. And it's not a racist narrative because, of course, when Israel commits the same sorts of sins, they likewise are driven from the land by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. According to the narrative, there are two texts in Joshua which tell you that the people in the land knew of the amazing things that God could do, and so they chose nevertheless to shut up Jericho and to resist. In other words, there was divine revelation to them. So that's what we can see about the Canaanites. And furthermore, according to the narrative, they were people who uh, committed child sacrifice. As it says in Deuteronomy, every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they've done for their gods. They even burned their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. And you could try and argue for some historicity to this, but that's a distraction to the argument. We then look at the role that Israel plays. And we could argue that Israel has a unique position as God's judicial representative in the story. In fact, we could argue that at no subsequent point was Israel ever God's judicial representative in the same way. So it really was a completely unique thing for a, a nation in a unique position historically. We can also say that the, the commands that were given to Joshua and to Moses were given in a very miraculous context. Of course, you have the greatest display of miracles in the entire Old Testament with the coming out from Egypt. You then have the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, and so on. And that means that in terms of epistemic warrant, in terms of the uh, grounds that there are to believe that these commands really do come from God, we have a massive amount, and that's very different from the analogies that people sometimes like to make today where people hear God's voice in their head 
or where certain um, Islamic theologians get together and they decide on the basis of their exegesis that they can then attack random targets. That's very different from a situation in which God's voice booms to 603,550 men from the top of a mountain, um, authenticating this is really God's revelation of the Ten Commandments, authenticating the person of Moses, and so on. So in terms of epistemic warrant, we're dealing with a different level. We can also say that one of the strange things in the narrative is that concern to do something in a very limited and proportional way. One of the absences from the narrative is going and inflicting extra special pain on the Canaanites. There is, of course, the case of Adonai Bezek, who had his thumbs and big toes cut off, but that's because he'd done that to 70 kings. So in other words, he got what he'd already given to others. But what we find is the striking thing that when they go in and they conquer and they um, kill the kings of the nations, they want to take their bodies down from the tree by the end of the day in order not to um, uh, break that rule that you should uh, not hang up across a, 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 um, a body on, on a tree uh, it, through nightfall. And it's rather striking that we have that sort of concern going on there. They're not torturing these people and so on. If you got surrounded by the Assyrians, you weren't just worried that they would kill you, you were really worried about what they would do with you before they killed you. And we could say, and this is a what-if argument that the Bible doesn't actually use, but we could say, well, this command, if it had been fully put in place, would have put an end to Canaanite child sacrifice, and God might be able to do certain calculations. Of course, God can do certain calculations which work out future suffering. Now, we cannot use consequentialist um, justifications for what we do because we don't know the future, so we can't make those sorts of calculations. But actually, knowing the future can sometimes change what's morally okay. Let's say you go to the top of a hill on a road, you're driving along, and there's a car you want to pass in front of you. Now, in normal morality, you can't pass that car because you can't see over the summit of the hill. On the other hand, if you knew that the road had been cleared or you had friends the other side who were signaling to you um, in some electronic way or something like that, what would be immoral otherwise becomes moral. Often, again, with a three-year-old, they can enjoy being thrown up in the air. When my children were three, I used to do that. And, you know, they enjoy it. It's a moral action, provided you know you can catch them. If you don't know you can catch them, it becomes immoral. In other words, what's moral and immoral can change depending on future knowledge. Now let's factor in a God with all future knowledge. There may be things which he has morally sufficient grounds to do, which we can't possibly relate to because we, we don't know the future. So that is another part of the multifaceted answer. It's not that any one of these is conclusive, it's just that together they make up a picture where when someone says, this story in the Bible is morally indistinguishable from that modern atrocity, you want to say, actually, we have so many different factors that make it different. We could also say that according to the narrative, God reveals himself as with an asymmetry in relation to mercy and uh, wrath and, that means wrath in your language, doesn't it, uh, anger. <clears throat> the point is he's merciful, quick to be merciful and slow to anger. Is that just a claim in the narrative? No, it's actually worked out in the narrative. That is, uh, we find that hundreds of years before to Abraham, uh, he says, you're going to go into this land or your descendants will go into this land, but they cannot go in yet because the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. In other words, they're not yet bad enough. So he waited hundreds of years, and the fact that in the narrative he waits hundreds of years fits very much within the narrative, him claiming to be slow to anger. Also in the narrative, an atheist might easily miss this, God does most of the fighting. He's the one who makes the walls of Jericho collapse. When the armies are assembled against Joshua, most of them are, are killed by the hail that God sends. In other words, you can't just water down this narrative and make it a naturalistic narrative without really missing the main points. So 
Someone might say, well, okay, that's just the way the Bible puts it. But the Bible is this sort of self-justificatory literature. It's trying to present Israel's side, and it's trying to make it sound really good. But actually, it can't be that. Do you know any other national literature that says as much bad about the people group from which it originates as Israel's national literature, the Old Testament? In fact, when we compare the most proverbially wicked nation or city in the Old Testament, that's Sodom in Genesis 19, and you know that story about, you know, uh, bring out your, your, um, the, the men that we may know them, and uh, Lot, righteous, uh, says, oh, here are my two virgin daughters. There's a very similar story, isn't there, when you go on to Judges chapter 19, but this time it's Gibeah. It's one of Israel's own cities, and the point is that Gibeah has become as wicked as the most proverbially wicked city in the whole Old Testament. In fact, when you read on in the Old Testament, you find that Manasseh is practicing child sacrifice. He's described as doing worse than the Amorites. So in other words, as the narrative goes on, it's not that Israel is portrayed as being really good. In fact, it's going to be uh, driven into exile because of its wickedness. We can also say that when people want to claim that the Bible makes other people, uh, people kill others today, that we can say, no, we realize that people, when they read the Bible, recognize the distinction. Now, there are times in the uh, uh, earth where people... Uh, read the Bible and they do things that the, on the grounds of what they believe they have read which are not morally justified. But that can't really be blamed on the literature if they were reading it properly. They should realize that no group has the same unique judicial position as God's judicial representative as Israel did. Again, they should recognize the difference between their own situation and that very miraculously attested Old Testament situation. So normal readers should know that what they're reading about is completely different from all modern wars. Therefore, when people want to say that there's a basic analogy between the Old Testament and modern religious terrorism and genocide, I'd want to say, actually, there are multiple, multiple differences. When they want to equate Joshua and Hitler and Saddam, we find, if we can just keep the next seven slides through, um, we find that there are just many, many differences which distinguish those two things. There may be many more differences, uh, but the, the point is this, that when people say this is morally indistinguishable, together they make up a picture that just makes you say, well, this is very different. Then we can say, when people make an objection, they're often wanting to draw an analogy. The point is, God telling people to kill people in the Old Testament, and people having uh, religiously motivated terrorism and killing people today. And, and those can look superficially similar. But many times, things that look superficially similar can be morally worlds apart. So take a, someone who takes someone's limb off. You can have that going on in Sierra Leone in a terrible massacre, and that's a moral abomination, and you can have someone taking someone's limb off as a caring surgeon doing everything they can to help that person. So superficially similar, someone taking someone's limb off, a human taking someone's limb off. On the other hand, morally worlds apart. Which objection, in fact, are people making? It seems to me there are only really two valid objections to the morality of the narrative. One is the objection that it was immoral for God to command the destruction of the Canaanites. Of course, then I need to be able to show that there could be no possible morally sufficient ground for an all-knowing God to command what he had uh, commanded in the Old Testament. And you realize that, of course, the level of proof that you're going to have to demonstrate there is pretty high. So to show that the author of all life could not possibly command that is very unreasonable. On the other hand, you might want to maintain that it was immoral for the Israelites to obey such a command if it really had been given the way the Bible describes. But of course, the Israelites had experienced God's faithfulness. They knew him to be good, and it came with a huge amount of epistemic warrant. Would you, in fact, convict the Israelites of uh, a crime in that situation if you were in the jury? Maybe you would, and we can discuss that maybe sometime later in the week. There could be another objection, and this would be the simple objection that reading the narrative makes people do immoral things. The problem of this is that you need to bring forth empirical data showing that it actually does. And it also might prove too much, because if I could, for instance, show that reading Dawkins's God delusion caused someone to do something bad, then 
would that also show that his God delusion was a bad thing? Or if I could show, for instance, a, a classic book like uh, Darwin's Origin of the Species led some people to infer from that that they could develop a master race and, a, you know, and genocide and so on. Can I then impugn Charles Darwin uh, with great immorality on, the, on that basis? Now, some Christian apologists would go there, but I might just want to say, let's have a truce. That is, uh, you want to say, blame a book for bad things that people do having read it, why don't we just have a truce? I mean, I I could probably make a pretty good case that so many more good things come from reading the Bible um, than uh, any bad things that people do after reading the Bible. I could make a case for the greater good moral effect of the Bible than any other book. So we we could go there, but I'm not a historian, so I just would draw a truce because I can't really um, handle the subsequent effects of uh, what's been done in in the Bible, because I think you need a a good training on that. But my my point is this, three objections, it was immoral for God, it was immoral for the Israelites, or there's an immoral effect. And I don't think any of those really stand up. But this is, I think, arguably the most awkward question people can ask of the entire Old Testament. I don't think I've answered it, but I think we can at least show that it's not a defeater. And the fact that it's not a defeater should give us a lot of grounds for trusting. Because when people ask questions, I usually want to ask them one of two things. Is this your most difficult question or is this your most important question? Because those are really the only two questions we're interested in dealing with. And the most difficult question, if you can say, well, if I can answer the most difficult question, are you prepared to accept that all the other questions you have could be answered? Because if you can answer the most difficult question, that should be the status, logically, of the rest. So I'd want to say the fact that we can make at least a reasonable attempt at this most difficult question means that there aren't really moral defeaters in the Old Testament. Thank you very much.